to test. Confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you.
Bernino. Oh, okay, there we go. All right. All right, we'll go ahead and we'll come in and have a seat. We'll get started. So we have the prayer in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit. Father in heaven, we love you and we adore you and we ask that you would send your spirit upon us as you send it upon Saul, as you send it upon King David. We need you. Without you, we can't understand your word. Without you, we can't follow you. We devolve quickly into idolatry and superstition. Holy Spirit of God, we need you to have wisdom and courage to follow you even when everything else is against us. Come, Lord Jesus, be present among us. We thank you for being here in the Blessed Sacrament. We ask that you would open our ears to hear your word and our hearts to receive it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good to have you all back. Um, tonight we're going through 1 Samuel. Before I do that, though, we just had a healing night last week. How many were at the healing night last week? Did anybody have a testimony they did not share because they were afraid to, or they weren't really sure, but now they're really sure that they were healed? Did we have one that wanted to share? Okay, I just want to keep that open. Always want to check and see what the Lord's doing, because uh, tonight's topic really goes in nicely with what we've been doing during the healing nights, uh, as you'll see. So, 1 Samuel is really looking for a good king. We've been talking about the time of the judges, which is all messed up. And we're showing how we need to have a king. And so if you look at the book of 1 Samuel, really 1 and 2 Samuel are meant to be taken as one book. We're kind of splitting them in two, but they're kind of originally were one book. And 1 and 2 Kings are kind of one book. And in fact, in a lot of older translations, if you have the Latin Vulgate, they will have 1 and 2 Samuel and 1 and 2 Kings as books one through four of kings. So if you have an old translation, it'll sometimes be one to four kings. You're like, what's that? That's what this is, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, and 2nd Kings. They sometimes call that the book of the, the four books of Kings. Okay, just so you're aware of that. There's uh, a couple of things we want to touch on. The first is that we're looking for a good king, and the king we're going to settle on is David, but not without going through Saul first. Okay, now the name David means the beloved one. Okay, and I wrote up here on the top, in Hebrew, there are no vowels. There's only consonants. Okay, so this is how it would be in Hebrew. This is the name David, just D, V, D, essentially. And in Hebrew numerology, every letter has a number, like A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, etc. So in Hebrew, D is the fourth letter, V is the sixth letter, and D is the fourth letter. You add those three together and you get the number 14. Why is this important? Well, because David's number is 14. When we get to Matthew's gospel and they give the genealogy of Jesus Christ, it said the number of generations from Abraham here was 14 generations. And the number from David to the Babylon exile, 14 generations. And from the Babylon exile to the Christ, 14 generations. So what we're saying is three times, David, David, David. This is the son of David, the fulfillment of the Davidic line. Does that make sense? If you're not a Jew, you wouldn't pick up on that, right? If you're not really immersed in the Jewish tradition, you wouldn't understand that either. But the Bible is full of these little secrets that if you're really paying attention, you'll get to. So David, of course, is the beloved son of God. He, it's the shifting now. We've talked about Moses a whole lot, but now we're hardly going to talk about him at all for the rest of the Bible. Moses is mentioned almost 800 times in the first part of the Bible that we've been in, but David's mentioned over 1,000 times from here on outward. So he definitely is the focus, and we're going to see why. Because David is meant to be a representation of the church, meant to be the fulfillment in Christ Jesus, and also is meant to be an image of what you and I are called to be as baptized believers. Okay, so... Um, what we show here in the book of 1 Samuel is three sections of 1 Samuel. The first is the transition from Eli, who's the priest, to Samuel. Okay? And then the second section, we're going to see the anointing of King Saul and then the rejection of King Saul. And the third section, we're going to see the choosing of David and his rise while this kingdom of Saul collapses. And the end of the book ends with Saul's death. So that's kind of where we're going as a roadmap. Okay? 
Um, there's going to be several themes that are going to come up as we're going through. I just outlined a few of them. The first theme that's going to come up is wicked leaders bring a curse on their people. We see that very clearly, whether it's a priest, whether it's the king, if you're not good, you're going to cause your people to suffer. And in some cases, actually bring a curse of death upon them. So that's one theme. The second is we're going to see superstition. There's a ton of superstition in this book. And it corrupts real faith. And when you see and understand what superstition is, you're going to realize how dangerous it is for our life of faith today. And in fact, we've got a ton of it around. And some of you may even be superstitious right now. And I'm going to have to tear it out of you. <laughs> because superstition is completely opposed to faith. The Catechism says this about superstition. Superstition is the deviation of religious feeling and of the practices the feeling imposes. It can even affect the worship we offer the true God. For example, when one attributes an importance in some way to certain practices otherwise lawful or necessary. To attribute the efficacy of prayers and sacramental signs to their mere external performance apart from interior dispositions is to fall into superstition. Let me repeat that in other language, okay? Because sometimes it's hard to hear. Uh, superstition means you believe in something because of its external observance and not because of the interior heart of it. Does that make sense? So it is possible to believe in the sacraments in a way that is superstitious. Now that might be hard to hear, but the fact of the matter is, is someone just says, well, as long as I go to confession, um, it doesn't matter if I actually repent. As long as I say stuff, right? No, 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 no. That's a, that's a sacrilegious action. If you go to confession, you're not sorry. You need to be sorry when you go into confession. Or if you come to the Holy Communion, it's like, yeah, I can go ahead and receive it. It's going to change me, but I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about it. That's also false. You need to repent before you come to communion, right? I, does this make sense, right? Or, or just because we're married, that means everything's going to get better. I see sometimes this in marriage prep. Oh, it's, it's fine. Once we get married, it'll be fine. He'll change, I'm sure. He's a drug addict. <laughs> Oh, he might go to treatment one day. <laughs> no, dump him. <laughs> because the sacrament is not magic. It doesn't just do something because you do it, right? Now, we believe the sacraments work, right? But the fact is it won't transform your life in an affective way if you don't submit to it. Baptism does forgive our sins. It works. Ex opere operato. We believe that. But the fact is, is that if you don't give your life to Jesus, then that's not going to do you much good. In fact, it'll be worse for you because you'll receive this incredible treasure and you'll have poured it into the garbage by your life. So the sacraments are meant to lead to interior transformation. We're going to see this happen where Saul, in a very particular way, has a magical attitude toward things and it destroys him. Okay? All right? Um, we also see the anointing as a theme. People, when they're anointed, they receive the Holy Spirit. And it's a spirit of prophecy. Okay? And the king needs this to be able to govern well. And we need it too, right? Then we're going to see the theme of respect for the Lord's anointed. When someone is anointed and they have the Holy Spirit, you better respect them because God dwells in them, right? And David's going to show us how to do that. And then lastly, music and spiritual warfare. This one's fun. That's why I brought my guitar today. Because we're going to see that actually David, through the power of music, is the first exorcist in the Bible. The first time a demon is driven out is because of what King David does with his lyre, which is like the ancient guitar. <laughs> right? So we're going to get through all of that as we go through the scriptures. Okay? Right, first, let's go through the first part of it. And we'll just touch on these things as we go through. And I'll try and get through as much as we can. We're obviously not going to be able to touch on everything, so I will skim over some things. But have your Bible in front of you, and we'll go through these things. Okay? So let's open up to 1 Samuel. All right. <clears throat> As you start in chapter 1, we see that Eli is the high priest, and there's a woman, Hannah. She's barren. She can't have any kids. And she cries about this to the Lord. Now, she is one of two wives, right? And her, her sister wife is able to have kids, and she isn't. And this causes problems. See, again, more wives, more sorrow. It's not good. The Bible doesn't like multiple wives, right? Even though it doesn't condemn it outright, we see every time somebody has more than one wife, it's a problem. So you should put two and two together. Go back to the original plan in Genesis. Amen? Okay, good. All right. Excuse me. So anyway, she goes into the temple. She prays to God. 
Eli thinks she's drunk. Really, he's very not a very compassionate priest. Anyway, um, but he's still the priest. And, uh, and then he blesses her and asks that the Lord would answer her prayer. She goes home. She conceives, bears a son, and promises to give him to God as a consecrated soul. So this is like the Nazarite promise of Samson that he would have given to the Lord forever. Okay, and then we see in chapter 2, Hannah's song. See if this sounds familiar to you. My heart exalts in the Lord. My strength is exalted in my God. My mouth derives my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Does this sound like a song that some other woman sang? Yes, because guess what? Mary knows her Bible. The Blessed Mother knows her scriptures, and this was a song for women, particularly. Jewish women would have memorized the song of Hannah, and Mary takes this song and, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through prophecy, changes it for her situation and perfects it, right? So Hannah's song is, as you were, the base material that Mary's pulling from, and in fact, Samuel becomes an image of of the Christ, but also as an answer to prayer, but also John the Baptist, because his mother was barren and couldn't have kids, right? So we see Samuel becomes a type of John the Baptist, Hannah becomes a type of Elizabeth, right? And the Blessed Mother who sings the Magnificat, all right? So we see, although that there, not everything is happy here, because Eli is, uh, while he's a decent priest, he has wicked sons. His wicked sons are taking the best parts of the sacrifices, which was not permitted, uh, and they also were committing sexual abuse of the people who were coming. So very bad, wicked priests. And Eli basically slaps him on the hand and doesn't do anything about it. And because of this, God sends a prophet to him and says, if you don't change, I'm going to take away the priesthood from you, right? And then God speaks to the little boy Samuel, who is sleeping in the house of God, where the Ark of the Covenant is, and he hears the voice of God, right? So let's, let's look at that. The Lord calls him. This is in chapter 3, verse 3. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down within the temple of the Lord where the ark was. And the Lord said, Samuel, Samuel. He said, here am I, and ran to Eli. He said, here I am, you called me. He said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down, and the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am, you called me. He said, I did not call, my son, lie down again, right? So you see, Samuel doesn't yet know what the Lord's voice sounds like. Do you not know what the Lord's voice sounds like? Not unless somebody teaches you. Right? Sometimes it's not really clear what the Lord's voice sounds like. And so oftentimes God is speaking to us and we don't get it. Right? I, I, I found this out in my life is that I'm expecting God to like whisper in my ear, this little voice, but that's usually not how it happens. Some of you may have that experience, but sometimes God speaks to the imagination. The way he speaks to me is through physical sensation. I will feel pain in my heart if I know somebody here needs prayer, or I will feel pain in my body if I know that God is asking to pray for something, or I will know that the Holy Spirit is present because of a particular sense that I've learned over time that that's from the Lord. But he speaks in every person in a different way way. Some of you speak through smells. How many of you have ever had an experience where you smelled something really beautiful, right? Some people have come in here and they said, I've smelled roses, Father, and there's no roses, right? So things like that, and there's nobody wearing rose perfume either, right? So, so it's saying sometimes people are really sensitive. Other times people have had this experience, they walk into a place and they smell sulfur, right? It's like sometimes the devil is stinky, right? So in any case, if you don't know, it's and now the third time when he comes, Eli was realized that the Lord was calling him. So Eli instructs him, says, go lie down. And if it happens again, say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. He does. God gives him a prophecy. And it's not a good one. It says, basically, Eli is going to lose the priesthood and his sons are going to die. They're all going to die. Okay. So sometimes what God has to say is not very happy, right? Because sometimes it's his judgment, right? But in any case, he tells this to Eli, and Eli, because this other guy had already told him that prophetic word, he realizes this boy didn't hear that prophecy. This is actually a word from the Lord. But he doesn't repent. Oddly. Weird. So anyway, now we get to chapter 4, where his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, the evil priests, they're going out to battle, and they're losing. And they're like, huh, what's happening here? I know we need the ark. We're going to treat it like a magic amulet. We're not going to change our lives. We're just going to bring this magical device into the, ba into the battlefield. And in fact, you know that they're tr treating it superstitiously, because as soon as they bring it into the camp, look what they do. This is chapter 4, all right? Chapter 4, verse 3. The troops came to the camp. The elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord put us to rout before the Philistines? Let's bring the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh that he may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. So it's basically saying, hmm, maybe there's something wrong. Let's, let's bring in the Ark. And then, in verse 5, when the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp, all Israel gave a mighty shout. So the earth resounded. When did they shout before? Remember that? When was that? Jericho, right? So what they're doing is they're trying to repeat what happened in Jericho. We took the ark and we shouted and the walls fell down, right? But is that why the walls fell down? No, it's because they were being obedient to the command of God who told them to do that. It wasn't just because we have this magical ark that's going to save us, right? So they're treating it like a superstitious ritual and they get trounced because of it, right? And the ark gets stolen and Hophni and Phinehas die, right? And so does Eli when he gets the news, right? 
But the Philistines get it back. Don't worry, the ark's okay. It can take care of itself. It causes a whole bunch of plagues and, uh, and tumors or hemorrhoids, which is funny. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so then they send it back, and all is well that ends well for now. And then Samuel becomes the new judge. And we see that Samuel is not like Eli in the beginning. Um, he gets the people to repent. He offers sacrifice, and the Philistines are routed. Okay, so he, things are looking good, except right in the next chapter, uh, chapter 8, when Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Are they any different than Eli's sons? No, they are not. They take bribes. And so everyone's like, this is no better than Eli. We want a king. Okay? And so they ask for a king. And they say very clearly, they want a king for two reasons. Right? This is in chapter 8, verse 19. The people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, don't get a king. They said, no, we will have a king over us that we may be like all the nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. This is a rejection of their identity, because you remember what their purpose was, was to not be like everybody else. It was to be a people set apart. And secondly, they were supposed to let God fight their battles. And so now they're saying, we're not interested in God fighting our battles. We want someone else to lead us. So this is a rejection of God. It's a spitting in his face. But God honors it, because remember, he put that in Deuteronomy. He gave provisions for a king when they asked for one. So that goes into effect, and they're like, let's find a king. And of course, they find Saul. But here's the deal. Um, Saul has a few problems here. Uh, in chapter 9, this, we get a little bit of a hint this isn't going to turn out so well. Chapter 9, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, son of Zeror, etc. A man of wealth, and he had a son whose name was Saul, a handsome young man. There was not a man among the sons of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So that's the only good thing we hear about him is he's really tall and handsome and rich. Are those the characteristics of a good king? Nope. And also, he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Was that one of the royal tribes? No. There were only two tribes that got a royal blessing. That was Judah and Joseph. He's not from that tribe. So we know this isn't going to work out already from the beginning because this is not God's plan. So we're judging by appearance, and that doesn't work very well. It works for a little while. We see that the Holy Spirit comes. So in chapter, chapter 10, Samuel finds him, takes a vial of oil and poured it on his head, kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over the people? This will be the sign that the Lord has appointed you prince. When you depart from today, you will find the, the mules you were looking for. He was trying to find donkeys. And then verse, down a little bit farther, there's a garrison of the Philistines. In verse 5, as you come into the city, you'll meet a band of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, lyre, prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily upon you, and you shall prophesy with them and be turned into another man. We've got to stop a little bit. What is prophecy? What does this mean? All right? Let's, let's look a little bit further. All right? So we see this happen. This is in verse 9. When he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. When he came to Gibeah, behold, a band of prophets met him. The Spirit of God came mightily upon him, and he prophesied among them. And when all who knew him before saw how he prophesied with the prophets, the people said, what's come over him? So something radical has happened to him, so much so that people are like, this dude is weird. What happened to him? Let's compare that to Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. What happens to the disciples? The Holy Spirit comes upon them and begins speaking in other languages. And what do they say? These people are drunk. They are drunk. And Peter, then he says, no, we're not drunk. This is the Holy Spirit. So what we're seeing is sort of drunken behavior, if you will, in the prophets. This is, in every culture, they have prophets or priests that go into ecstatic trances. So this happens in all cultures, right? So you have guild prophets that they train their members how to do these kind of prayers to get themselves into an ecstatic state. And then they speak from that place, right? Saul was not trained by them. God just did it in him spontaneously. That's what's different about this, right? And in fact, that's... We see this only in a few people. In the Old Testament, we only see it in guild prophets. And that's why they say if a prophet speaks a word and it doesn't come true, you stone them. Because what they're saying is they went into this ecstatic trance where they don't have control of what they're saying and they're speaking something. If it's false, it means they're taken over by a demon. Okay? It's really radical. Okay? So the fact is, is that they're saying Saul has this spirit of prophecy even though he wasn't trained in it, even though he wasn't part of this lineage of prophets. So this is something new that's happening. Okay? Right. We're going to come back to that. We also see that um, later on, both Saul and David prophesy together, and they actually behave like crazy people, right? They lay in the street naked all day, like prophesying. You're like, oh, that's weird, right? You know, I don't want that to happen to me. But then again, doesn't that happen when some people get drunk sometimes? They behave very oddly. However, it's like, this is, this is again, a mystery in the spirit. Okay, moving on. Okay. So now we see Saul. He's received the Holy Spirit, um, and we see in, a, in chapter 11... 
He defeats the Ammonites, and look at this in chapter 11, verse 1. Nahash the Ammonite went up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. Do you remember what Nahash means in Hebrew? Anybody remember? First day of class. What does Nahash mean? Who was the Nahash that came into the garden? The serpent. Yes. So his name is Serpent. Right? And Saul defeats him through the spirit of prophecy. He becomes an image of Jesus who defeats the serpent. Right? So he's a type of Christ, actually. Really kind of interesting, right? So he, he delivers him, and then we actually even see that some people didn't want him to be king. So we see this in chapter 10, verse 26, or 27. Some worthless fellows said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, right? But at the end of it, <clears throat> the end of chapter 11, after he defeats the enemies, the people said to Samuel, who is it that said, shall Saul reign over us? Bring them here that we put them to death. But Saul said, not a man would put to death this day, for the Lord brought deliverance to us. Remember that weird parable in Luke's gospel? Or we had the kingdom parable where some people didn't want him to become king. He came back, gave the talents, and at the end he said, where were those men who didn't want me to be king? Bring them here and slay them before me. That's Jesus giving that parable. When Saul didn't do it, now Jesus does. Why? What changed? Because this is a parable about the end times. This isn't the time for the judgment right now. Now is the time of mercy. Later on at the end, it'll be too late. Make sense? Okay. So anyway, that's in Luke. Uh, you can look that up, Luke nineteen twenty-seven. The parable. Okay. So now Samuel is... Um, is basically telling them, you guys won't like having a king, I warned you, um, but you asked for it, so here you go. And then chapter 13, we see it start to unravel. Saul, he gets impatient, and he offers the sacrifice himself. Samuel's late. Samuel, whenever he offers a sacrifice, they win the battle. And so now the men are getting antsy. Where's the priest? The Philistines are here. They're about to get us. What are we going to do? They're starting to run away. And Saul says, wait, 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 wait. I'll offer the sacrifice. And he acts like a priest and sacrifices himself. And just right then, like a Seinfeld episode, bam, 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 open the door. Hey, what's going on here? You know? <laughs> and so uh, it's, not, it's not okay. Of course, because he's disobedient, he took the priesthood upon himself. He loses the stability of his kingdom. So God takes the gift of his dynasty from him. But he's still the king. Right? But he won't last. So that's taken away. And then he makes a rash decision in chapter 14 that curses his son. So we see again, he, pro he, he makes a rash oath, just like we saw in Judges, that brought about the death of his daughter. Uh, this would have killed Jonathan, but then the people rise up and they say, no, Jonathan saved us today. We want him to be saved. And so we see his authorities being undermined because he's a rash leader. Okay? And Jonathan will eventually die, but just not for a while. The curse is delayed. Okay? So again, Saul acts as a prophet even when he's being wicked. And this is what's really fascinating about the spirit of prophecy is that um, it's still operative in him even when he is sinning. And this, I think, is really helpful for us to understand because um, the Lord's anointed today, bishops and priests, they can be very wicked and still sometimes they can get it right. And so we still respect not because they're good but because the spirit of the lord is in them that's a challenge for me right but it's the same teaching that's here we have to recognize david shows us he doesn't hurt the lord's anointed he doesn't speak against them even when they're being wicked he says the lord will repay them we need to pray for that to happen that they would repent or that the lord would take care of them okay all right so skipping ahead a little bit da, 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 da. all right now we get <clears throat> The, the nail in the coffin for Saul in chapter 15. Samuel gives the Lord, give a command to Saul. It's chapter 15, verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people. Now listen to the word of the Lord. Remember the Amalekites that they snuck up behind you and they ambushed you when we were coming into the promised land? Now it's time to execute judgment upon them. I want you to destroy them all. Don't take any prisoners. Don't take any booty. You destroy all of it, okay? Because it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to me. This is a long time coming. You need to eliminate everything. And Saul flat out disobeys. He captures the king. He takes the best sheep and oxen and gold and everything and says, I'm going to offer it as an offering to the Lord. But we know what he's going to do. He's going to cut for himself, right? So we see a direct disobedience to the Lord. And because of this, we see the stinging indictment from Samuel, right? So Samuel is going to catch him in the act because he knows what he did, right? This is in chapter 15, verse 13. Samuel came to Saul. Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He even has the audacity to say that. And then Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep I hear? Right? And the lowing of oxen, which I hear. And Saul said, Oh, yeah, those things. I brought them out from the Malachites, so the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord, your God. Oh, the Lord, your God? What about the Lord, your God? My God, right? No, no, it's Samuel's God, not my God anymore, because my God's myself. Ooh, you see how quickly things are going bad? 
And so then Samuel, he's like, he gives him an opportunity to repent, right? He says, wait, stop. I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he says, go ahead. Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king. He sent you on a mission and said, go do this. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. That's not a good thing to do when you're caught in the act to just kind of double down. Okay, not good. Gives an opportunity to repent and he doesn't do it, right? So therefore, Samuel said, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offering as sacrifice as obedience to the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to listen to the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you rejected the word of the Lord, he's rejected you from being king, right? So now we have the rejection of Saul. We're moving into the third segment. Now we need somebody who's actually going to do what God says, okay? All right, so now um, we're going to... Samuel's sad over the king. It says he grieves over Saul. And the Lord's like, don't grieve over him. I'll take care of him. You do what I tell you. It's time for you to anoint somebody else who's really going to do what I tell him to. So now he goes uh, to anoint David from the house of Jesse. And he goes, and here we're going to see a difference. In chapter 16, he comes to Jesse's house. He has a ton of sons. He says, come here and bring all your sons. He invited them to sacrifice. Verse 6, when they came, he looked on Eliab, the oldest, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed is here before me. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or how tall he is. Because we know how well that worked last time. Isn't that funny? Like, there's all these, like, funny things that you just, you miss it, right? If you're not really paying attention, right? Because I have rejected him. The Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So we're going to see and we're going to hear all throughout the scriptures that David is a man after God's own heart. Okay? So he is, he is brought in from the field. He's anointed. And the Holy Spirit comes upon him mightily from that day forward in verse 13. So now we come to the first exorcism. In chapter 16, verse 14, follow on here. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the evil spirit from God is upon you, he will play it, and you will be well. So they find David, skip toward the end, verse 23. David took the lyre and played it with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. So we see very clearly there's a connection between the Holy Spirit and driving out of the evil spirit, right? Now, you might ask the question, because later on you notice the king tries to kill him and pin him to a wall, and his music doesn't work that time. So why doesn't it work? Because he's choosing to hold on to his jealousy and resentment. You can't be free if you don't want to be. And this is really a sad thing. Is some people, they say, Father, I really want help. I really, can you pray for me? Can you do that? Like, I'll, I'll have you to pray for you. Are you, willing to, are you willing to stop sleeping with your girlfriend? No, I can't. It's like, oh, well, I mean, come on, you know. Are you willing to, are you willing to give up your drugs? No, I just, I just can't. I'm weak. Like, okay, are you going to try? No, I just can't. <laughs> well, then we're not ready for this conversation. <laughs> right? Because I can, it's like people come, they ask, Father, can you bless our house? I, are you guys married? No, we're not married. You know, one day, we'll just like, I can kick something out of the house, but you're going to invite it right back in. Right? I mean, we, we just have to take seriously. If we want to be free, we have to change our lives. Yes? Or Yes. Okay, good. So anyway, um, David has the Holy Spirit. Now we have the story of David and Goliath, which is one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Um, really great. Um, not going to read it. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, story of David and Goliath. Of course, Goliath is a giant, right? One of the, the, the ancient uh, foes, right, who, who's left over from Genesis. And uh, he's just terrifying the Israelites, and nobody's standing up to him. And so David, who's a little boy, right, he's like, I'll fight him. Let me at him. I got it. I took care of bears and lions with my slingshot. I got this dude, right? It's like, you are nuts, boy. It's like, why, why am I nuts? God is with us, is he not? This guy is insulting God. I'm going to protect his honor and God's going to be with me. And the same God who delivered me from the lion and the bear is going to deliver me from this giant ogre. Why should this uncircumcised Philistine torment the armies of God, right? And so the king's like, great, put on my armor. He's like, no, nah, I can't wear that. I can't be somebody else. I'm who I am. I'm not going to rely on military strength. I've got to rely on what God has given to me. And he does. He goes, boom, one rock, bam, he's down. And he takes his own sword, the sword of Goliath, from his sheath, cuts off his head. Boom. Yeah. And then the Philistines are routed. And at that day, on chapter 18, when they're coming home from the battle, here's where the problem starts. 
Chapter 18, verse 6. As they were coming home, when David returned from slaying the Philistine, the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with timbrels, songs of joy, and instruments, instruments of music. And they sang this song. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And this song, it probably wasn't sung like that. I don't know. <laughs> but that song drives him nuts. Saul allows jealousy to enter his heart. He says, wait a second. This kid's going to take the throne. That song becomes a brain worm over and over and over in his head. It's said several times throughout the rest of this book. He doesn't rebuke it. He doesn't cast it out. Even when he sees David being good to him, he continues to believe the lie that David's trying to steal the throne from me. Do you see how important the stuff we let into our brain is? How many of you listen to music sometimes that's really not good? It's got lyrics that are just horrible. They're sexual, they're violent, they're gross, they're profane, even demonic, sadly, right? And we just, they play over and over again in our minds, and yet we wonder why we're depressed and anxious and worried and filled with lust all the time. It's not a surprise, people. Clean up your music. Am I making sense to anybody? Right? When I was growing up, this is a true story, okay? I grew up in my house. My parents, they grew up in the 60s, so they listened to all kinds of music. When they got married, they said, our house, we're not going to play anything but Christian music. I didn't hear a secular song until I was in high school. True story. And when I heard it for the first time, I cried because it was so ugly. My brain had been formed to believe that music was something beautiful for the service of God. And I couldn't imagine that somebody was singing about doing something so horrible to their mom. Thank you, Eminem, right? I mean, like, really, I just it so rocked me because I realized people are listening to this soup of horrible stuff all day long. And you wonder why people are depressed, why we're always comparing ourselves to others, because the music we're listening to is horrendous. If you want to change your life this Lent, I, 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 I challenge you, get rid of all profane music and only listen to Christian music or Gregorian chant or classical music. It will change your life. Dead serious. That one change will change your attitude completely. Without anything else. Literally, that one thing will make you feel better. Am I making sense to anybody? Right? It's just, we have to take seriously, music is a language. The ancients knew this. The ancient philosophers, there was a kind of music you played when you were going to war, a kind of music when you were making love, a kind of music when you wanted to study, a kind of music when you were praying. Because the music itself, regardless of the words, some people say, I don't listen to the words. The, the words are important, right? But the music itself is, in fact, a message. That's why some music is not appropriate at Mass. It's not appropriate to have jazz at Mass. It isn't. Objectively speaking, because jazz is a very sensual music. It's designed to excite your lower functions. Do we want to do that at Mass? No. I don't want to be looking for, uh, I don't want to be on the prowl at Mass. Like, I want to be focused on Jesus, right? So the, the music needs to lead us into contemplation if we're going to have it at all. Right? That's another sidebar. We could do a whole class on that. In any case, um, we just recognize that the music is really important. One song sets him free, another drives him mad. Just saying, accept that message as you can. Okay. So he tries to kill David, David gets away, and then he tries a, a sneaky way to do it. He's like, hey, marry my daughter. He's like, oh, I'm, I'm a nobody. I, I, I can't be part of your family. No, don't worry, just kill 100 Philistines to take their foreskins, and then that'll be enough payment. So he's trying to get him to die in this battle. And David, of course, he, gets, he goes above and beyond. He's a good boy scout. He gets 200. <laughs> so that kind of backfires. And, uh, and, he, so he mar and so Saul has to give him his daughter. So now he's like, oh, gosh, now I'm cooked. He's now part of the royal family. What did I just do? So he's even more mad, right? And Jonathan, his firstborn son, is like, he's like a second brother. He loves David so much so that he enters into a covenant with him. He enters into a, a sacred promise with him to be part of his family. Like even before he marries uh, his sister, he's like, no, I want, to be one. I want to be one family with you. And they do a, an exchange of clothing, right? And this is really important. It's saying he gives this, this covenant ritual is ex affected by an exchange of clothing. And that's an image of baptism. We give our old clothing to the son of David, Jesus, and we receive his garments to put on. That's what happens to us in baptism. We give God our, our old dirty clothing and he puts on glory and life to us. That's why we wear a white garment, right? We're putting on Christ in when we've been baptized. Pretty cool, huh? So, all right. It's a lot of fun stuff. Continuing, the friendship is really great. 
Uh, and now David realizes he's got to get out of Dodge because uh, Saul is so angry, uh, he's going to kill him the first time he sees him, so he runs away. Do-do-do-do-do, where are we at now? We're just flying through here. Remember, this is Bible Basics. I hope that you're reading this because uh, there's lots of great stuff in here. We now see a story that's referenced in the gospel. So we want to stop here on chapter 21. So come with me to chapter 21. David's fleeing, and he flees so quickly he doesn't have provisions, so he's hungry. So David comes to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. He meets him out and says, why are you alone and no one with you? He says, the king charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything about which I sent you. Uh, I've made an appointment with the young men for such and such a place. Now then, what do you have at hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. The priest answered, David, I have no common bread. There is holy bread. It's the show bread. Remember, that was in the tabernacle, those 12 loaves that were replaced every week. That were the presence of God, right? So it's a Eucharistic image. But they're not priests, right? And so he says, oh, okay. He says, if only the young men have kept themselves from women, if they've been chased, then they can have of the holy bread. And so David answered the priest, of course, we've done this because we're on an expedition. And so the priest gave them the holy bread. So Jesus references this and he says, do you remember what Ahimelech did when he was high priest, how he gave the, the bread uh, that only the priests could eat to the disciples? He says, why are your disciples picking heads of grain on the Sabbath? You remember that? So he's saying, I'm the new son of David, right? David could do this. He had permission to do it. I am the new David who can do this for my followers. It's kind of fun. I, can, I, I, I made the law. I can remake it. <laughs> anyway, so, and then he takes the, the sword of Goliath that's there, so he gets his weapons, and he leaves, but there's a spy, Dog the Edomite, Doeg, right? <laughs> Doeg the Edomite, and he, of course, rats on the priests to Saul. Saul goes out, and he slaughters all the priests in vengeance. Now, here's what's really interesting. Did you notice how he refused to kill the enemies of God, and yet he slaughters the priests? He does to the priests what he should have done to the enemies of God. Because of this, God no longer speaks to him. Right? So the priests, and of course, all the rest of the priests who are with Saul, they leave and they go to David. Not surprisingly. <laughs> because they're like, okay, this guy's nuts. We're leaving. So all the priests have now aligned themselves with David and Saul no longer has access to God. Okay. All right, and David does a few other exploits, really great. And then there's two times where Saul is chasing David and David saves his life, spares his life. The first time, uh, they're hiding in a cave. Uh, yeah, verse yeah, 24 and 26. Yeah, so in chapter 24 and chapter 26, two episodes where he saves his life, where they're hiding in a cave. Saul goes in the cave to use the restroom, and uh, he could have killed him, but he doesn't. He just cuts off the tail of his garment to show, hey, I could have killed you, and I didn't. And so then he goes in peace, and he says, I won't kill you. But he changes his mind later, uh, obviously. And then, of course, in chapter 26, um, king's sleeping. His army's sleeping around him. He's got his spear by his head. David's general says, let me nail him. One shot. That's all I'll need. And he's like, will we remain unpunished if we touch the Lord's anointed? So twice he's giving his men who are with him the example, you don't touch him even if he's our enemy because he belongs to God. He was anointed, and that anointing, even though he's wicked, even though he's been pursuing us unjustly, the anointing of God is still on him. And for that reason alone, I will not kill him. Isn't that interesting? But that's the example that scriptures give us, right? So because of this example that King David does, his kingdom really lasts because all of his descendants saw that example. His kingdom lasts for 400 years, which is the longest that any kingdom in the ancient Near East ever lasted. So this example he gave is actually in his best interest because, like, if I can just kill the king because I disagree with him, guess what? I'm going to get assassinated too. So he's showing people this is the respect we owe to the king because he's not just a regular king. He's anointed king by God. All right. Very good. Okay. Good. I think we're getting close here. Okay. So now we, now we come uh, to the very end of uh, the first book of Samuel where uh, Saul, because the, the God is not talking to him anymore, uh, he, and Samuel's dead, uh, he goes to a witch to try and conjure up the dead. So what began as superstition, just treating sacrifice as superstition, and other thing, has now gone to full-on Satanism, like full-on witchcraft. And this is what happens. Superstition might seem benign. How many of you have had, seen those little bracelets? Like, I see these all the time, like these little bracelets. How many of you have a bracelet? Like, yeah, okay. These are good bracelets. These are like rosary bracelets. Sometimes you have little medals of Our Lady Guadalupe. How many of you have seen the ones with little eyeballs on it? How many of you got one of those on right now? I've got to tell you about the little eyeballs. You know, little, little beads that have the eye on them? You seen those things before? I see those all the time. Have you seen those before? You know what I'm talking about? The ojo, the ojo. You know what I'm talking about? You have to ask just the question, whose eye is that? Have you ever thought about that? 
Yeah, whose eye is that? It's not God. I'll tell you that much. And if it's not God's eyeball, I don't want it on me. You know what I'm saying? So the fact of the matter is, is that there's lots of superstitious things in our culture. If you're wearing one of those, take it off. I've seen people get spiritually oppressed with these things. Get rid of them. If you need spiritual protection, we have rosaries. We've got blessed medals of the saints, right? Do not go into superstition or good luck charms because these are not good luck charms. They are blessed with the blessing of the church for you. Right? These other things are demonic. They're not good. Okay. Or at the very least, they're just stupid, right? <laughs> Some people are just stupid and they just mix things together, right? I've seen like say Benedict Metal, Guadalupe, and the eyeball, and like all of a sudden I'm like, what is wrong with you people? <laughs> like or like four Benedict medals all together, like like or just like in a chain, just like this. It's like one is fine. I mean, seriously, that's superstitious Catholicism. There are superstitious Catholics out there, tons of them, okay? The fact of the matter is, is that one Benedict medal is enough. If you've got to, like, like, like dra- I've seen these things you hang on the doors and, like, 16 Benedict medals on them. Like, that is total superstition. If one's good, 16 are better. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I wear one. It's enough. And then you can have, like, a miraculous medal. Like, one of each kind. That's fine. Because you have a different devotion to este santito and this little one. That's fine. But, like, you don't need 15 of the same one. Think, guys. Anyway, that's another advertisement. Okay. We have a gift shop. You can, uh, no. <laughs> you can for forty nine ninety five. No, just kidding. All right. Anyway, um, <laughs> where was I? Holy moly. Okay. Anyway, so Saul now goes to a witch to try and get the answers he's looking for. He's about to go into battle. And... God isn't answering his prayers, and so he goes to a witch, right? Uh, And, of course, this backfires because uh, the witch conjures up Samuel, and Samuel tells him, you're going to die tomorrow. Have fun. (laughs) And he does. (laughs) So there you go. Don't do witchcraft. It leads to death. That's the message. Okay, good. All right. So then, of course, that's basically the end of the book. They go into battle. Uh, Saul's son Jonathan and Abinadab and all the rest of his sons die in battle. So that curse that came upon his son is finally fulfilled. But before he died, before Jonathan died, he made David promise that take care of my descendants. May none of my descendants come out of your house. So basically the curse that was going to fall on Saul and all of his family is is averted and healed because of the relationship with David. And this is a really good image for us because the curse of sin and death is going to take all of us unless we're in relationship with the new son of David. His blessing and covenant with him overrides any of the other curses of death. Make sense? Okay, good. That's basically where we want to be today. I just put a couple of things on the back here. Oh, for the love of Pete. Anyway, that never works. Okay. So just put a few of the types here. You see Saul, right? He's a type of a lot of things. He, the Saul in the New Testament that becomes St. Paul, he's a Benjaminite also. And he begins his life persecuting the son of David, right? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So even Saul is a type of the New Testament Saul. He's also a type of Jesus because he defeats Nahash. He's a type of Judas because he despairs in the end and commits suicide. He falls on his sword, right? David is a type of Jesus in many ways. He forgives his enemies and those who persecute him. He drives out demons. He's filled with the spirit and with prophecy. He's also a man after God's own heart, right? So the heart of Jesus, of course, uh, is one with the Father, right? For questions tonight, for those who are going to break off into small groups, for those who are in the RCAA, you have your own program, so you can go ahead and go um, with your leaders. So small groups for tonight, we're going to talk about something new. If you learned something new today, just talk about it. Feel free to talk about whatever you liked. The second one is, have you ever experienced the Holy Spirit the way it's been talked about with Saul or David in your life? Have you ever experienced that before? If so, what was it like for you? And if you haven't, would you like it? Right? Because in confirmation, this is what we're asking for. We're asking for the spirit of prophecy. We're asking for the spirit of power because you are called to be priests, prophets, and kings by your baptism because you're one with Jesus, who is the priest, prophet, and king, the new David. Right? And thirdly, does your music lead you closer or farther from God? Are you ready to make some changes if you need to? Right? And lastly, what kind of superstitions have you seen in the area if you get to that? Right? And do you need to clean up your house? Right? Just some good things to talk about. Um, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll break. Um, and we will, uh, we will come back. You can come back whenever you like. We're going to be doing something different here tonight uh, with, with the middle and high school. So we're going to do a little prayer experience. You're welcome to join us when, whenever you're finished with conversation. You'd like to join us back. Break. We'll come back.
Next week's homework is 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. Tester one, two. All right. Okay. Good. We'll go ahead and we'll we'll gather gather up here, guys. We'll go ahead and gather in the center section here, so everybody can just come into the center. That's great, because that way we can all be kind of closer together. So, guys, who are over here on this side, if you can come over here, thanks. Appreciate that. Tonight I want to have a, a, just a little bit of a conversation about uh, adoration. We talked a little bit about it. Uh, you, who, who, here, you guys, who was here at the healing night last week? Okay, right? Some of you, okay. We talked a bit about adoration, okay, and what we do in adoration. And it's come to my attention that I think we don't always know what to do. Some of you know what to do. You come here and you pray. Others may not know what we're doing. And so I want to just talk about it, and I want us to do a little prayer together, okay? So... Uh, but to do that, first, I want to just uh, share a little bit of, of a story, and that is the reason I brought the guitar today, not only just because we talked about David, who used music, but music is actually one of the surprises in my life um, that I never actually wanted to play the guitar. It was not on my horizon. I played piano. This was a gift from the Lord that he gave to me when I was in seminary. And uh, the Lord gave it to me 
because I wasn't able to pray. I was blocked. I was in a place of real darkness in my own formation on the way to priesthood. Just because I wanted to be a priest didn't mean everything was easy. And so there was a time in my life where I really questioned whether I was going to continue or not. And this was a gift from the Lord that drove out a demon of despair in my life. And so I believe truly that the Lord has given this to me in the same way that he gave it to David. So that's why I play it. I don't play it very much because now I'm a priest. You know, when I was a seminarian, I played a lot more. Um, but when you come to Hope and Healing Nights, my older brother, David, he, he plays music. You guys have seen David, right? You know, yeah. So he's my older brother. And he was the one who kind of led the way. My dad led the way. My brother received the gift. And then I received the gift. So it's one of those things where it's actually interesting, this guild prophet idea that we were talking about. I've actually experienced that in my life where this is actually a family gift where the Lord's been giving a gift of praise. And I want to share that with you a little bit. When I was going through high school, um, Eucharistic adoration changed my life. Okay, I always believe Jesus is here. We know that Jesus is here, yes? That's what we believe. At every Mass, Jesus becomes present under the forms of bread and wine. It looks like bread and wine, but it's not. It's Jesus, right? So when we have adoration, what we're doing is one of the hosts that was consecrated at Mass, we're putting it out in front so we can pray to Jesus face to face. That's why we call it adoration. We're praying to him face to face. You can do that in many ways. You can do that in quiet, just looking at him. You can pour out your heart to him and tell him what's going on. You can sing to him. You can just listen. You can pray the rosary. You can pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet. But when the one thing we don't want to do is just kind of uh, not engage it. Because if we really believe this is God, then you should ask him for what you need. Adoration has absolutely changed my life. And I want all of you to know him, to love him, and to serve him. How many of you have had a beautiful experience at adoration before? Yeah. 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 So it's been a neat thing, right? You know, How many of you have experienced a beautiful thing during healing nights? Right? Yeah. I mean, it's beautiful, right? I mean, it's like he's, he's here and he's alive, right? Um, how many of you heard Artemio's uh, uh, testimony last week? Did you hear that? Okay. So, and you saw the x-rays, right? I brought that here a couple weeks ago, right? It's even better than I imagine. It's getting better every time I hear it because there's more information that I'm getting, right? He actually, I need him, we need him to write it out because actually the doctor said the way that it healed is actually backwards. What I mean by that. Normally, when you break a bone, it heals from the crack downward, right, from the outside in. His healed from the inside out. It's like, that's why there's no scars. It's just like, it just kind of sealed up from the inside and just flowered. It's like something went into the center of his knee and then just flowered out and healed. Isn't that really cool? Like, this, every little detail is really just fascinating. In any case, um, it's a lot harder to talk about. Um, gifts of the spirit but rather than just experience them i want us to just take some time in prayer and i want to say there's a couple of things that we want to do when we come into adoration when we come into the church when we come into the church if we believe this is jesus what should we do with our body when we go into our pew what do we do somebody show me right show me what do we do when we come in and we're about to go into our pew what do we do we genuflect right so we go down on one knee and you go down on the right knee okay i see some people they do like little you know curtsies like you know stuff that's not what we're doing, okay? If this is God, give him the whole knee, okay? Unless you don't have a knee, that's okay. Then you can bow, okay, profoundly, okay? But I think a lot of you are young and you have knees, okay? And they work, right? But if you're old and they don't work or you've got a, a broken knee or you're on crutches, it's okay. You don't have to do that. But we want to honor his presence, okay? So don't just ignore him, right? Now, when he's exposed, when the tabernacle is open, what we do is we get on our knees, okay? So whenever that tabernacle is open, we get on our knees, right? When it closes, then we can sit down again, right? Or we can remain kneeling if we want the whole time because he's always here, right? But when he's exposed, we should be on our knees uh, because that's a sign of respect, okay? Or sitting, but sitting respectfully. We're not slouched. We're not kind of like looking over. It's to say, if I really believe this is God and he made me, what's my body saying to reveal that? Does that make sense? Okay. Um, some of you, uh, who, like, who likes to sing? Do you like singing along on the radio? Right? Some of you do, some of you don't, right? That's okay. Because when we fall in love with someone, we're willing to look stupid, right? Have you ever been in love before? If you haven't, it's a wild ride, okay? <laughs> but when you feel in love with somebody, you want to do anything you can for the other person, even if it makes you look silly. And that's the point. When we fall in love with him, we won't care what the person next to us thinks about what we're doing. 
That's really hard sometimes because we're always like, I don't know if this person is going to think I'm weird or whatever. Uh, I got to tell you, when the Holy Spirit comes upon me sometimes, I look like an absolute idiot. And, it, and I don't like it. <laughs> but I don't care in the moment because I'm the happiest I have ever been in my life. The first time it happened to me was when I was in college. And I was walking home. I was praying the rosary. I just, my priest had prayed for me for a new outpouring of the Holy Spirit because I was experiencing a block. And I'm walking home praying the rosary. And as soon as I open my mouth to pray the rosary, something else comes out. Not the Hail Mary, but something else that I'd never heard before. Like, whoa, whoa, what is that? I just start speaking. And all of a sudden, I close my mouth. I'm like, that's weird. I tried again. Still wasn't the Hail Mary. It was something else. And then I stopped. And then it was like a rainbow was exploding out of my stomach and coming out of my mouth. And I had to keep speaking. It was like I was vomiting rainbows. Just like It was like I was the happiest I'd ever been. I was speaking. I was like nonsense. I was like a child. I was like just babbling absolute craziness. And I thought, I hope nobody sees this. <laughs> I'm just like covering my mouth. I'm walking down the street. I'm like, oh my gosh. I got But I'm giggling and laughing. And I'm happier than I have ever been in my entire life. And it lasted for about 15 minutes. And then it was over. And after it was over, I had no fear of speaking in front of people. You see, it wasn't just me going mad for a minute. It was actually the Lord fixing something inside of me in a way that I couldn't understand. There have been many such experiences, but instead of talking about them, friends, would you like to pray for that? Would you like to pray for an experience of the Lord? If you've never given your life to Jesus, if you've never asked him to come into your heart, I'm going to challenge you to do that because he's right here. I'm not him. He is him. And I am me, right? But he is the one who's done everything good in me that I have to offer. And he's the one that's going to do everything good in you that you have to offer. And if you have pain, if you have depression, if you have anxiety, if you have physical pain, brothers and sisters, the Lord, the reason why we do healing nights is because God wants to heal us. And he's showing that. And in fact, he's doing it not just here, but all around the country. There, right now, how many of you have heard of Asbury, Kentucky? Okay, right now in Asbury, Kentucky, it's a college chapel. Right now, there is a Pentecost that's happening in Asbury, Kentucky. There were a group of college kids. They got in their chapel, and they were going to just do their hour-long chapel. They've been there for a few days. They haven't left. They haven't gone to sleep. They don't eat. They're just there praying around the clock. People are coming to a relationship with Jesus. They're having experiences like you hear in the Acts of the Apostles. This is happening right now in the United States of America. It's happening in other places, too. And friends, I think it's happening here as well, too. But we need to ask the Lord to be open to that reality because just like in the Acts of the Apostles, some people think it's weird. But friends, if you experience it, you're not going to care because you're going to be filled with courage. You're going to be filled with love and peace and joy. And do you want those things? Do you, think there's, do you want more to your life than just being on your phone all day and just hoping that you'll find something good? I haven't found something good on TikTok yet that saved my life. I haven't found something good yet on Instagram that's made me go, I want to change my life for that. But I have many times in adoration, brothers and sisters, experienced the love of God, and I want you to experience it with me. Do you want to pray for that? To help prepare for that, I want you to just, if you have your phones or whatever, I want you just to turn them off. Like, just turn them off, okay? I want us to enter into this time. Don't worry about what your neighbor's doing, right? If it's distracting sitting next to somebody else, that you know, move your seat. We're going to enter a time of prayer. We'll turn down the lights just a little bit just so you're not distracted by what other people are doing. But we're going to expose the Blessed Sacrament. We're going to come before him. We're just going to pray. And we'll sing a little bit. We're going to sing a little bit of the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Okay? We just did this as a staff at our staff retreat. And uh, it was so beautiful. It was really beautiful. And so I want to offer that to you that if we give ourselves to the Lord and if we pray, and you really are saying, God, I want a miracle. God, I need help. God, I'm weak, and I need to know who you are. I, I, I don't even know if you exist, but I want to know you. If that's where you're at, pray that. Because God meets you where you're at. He's not asking you to be somebody else. He's asking you to be honest with him. And if you are, he's going to meet you where you are. And he's going to bring you up higher. Sound good? Okay. I'm going to get ready real quick. If you want to come up closer, what, the reason why we, we actually redid the pews this way is so that this area up here is more available for prayer space. So if you want to come up here and you want to kneel, if you want to prostrate yourself on the floor, that's another way, too. You can, you can, you can lay down on the floor in front of the Lord if he's here and he's really inspiring you to do that. If you want to do that, that's what this space is for. If you want to spread out a little bit more, to sit, 
to, to pray here in the Lord's presence to be more comfortable. You don't have to sit in the pew if you don't want to, okay? But whatever you do, be respectful of the Lord. Sound good? Can we have that agreement together? Okay. Because I love him. And I can't force you to love him. But he loves you. He died for you. And he wants way, way more to give to you. And so if you're hungry and you want more, you come up to the front. If you're in pain and you want physical healing or if you need other prayer, you can just come right up here to the front, to these kneelers up here in front. Just come as close to him as you want. This time's for you, okay? All right, we're going to go ahead and we'll, we'll get started. And then um, when, when I expose the Blessed Sacrament, then we can get on our knees for a little bit. And then after a little while, after maybe just a minute or two, if it's painful for you, it's okay. You can, you can sit down. That's fine. Don't worry about it, right? But just be in a, a prayerful space. But whatever you do, take this time to pray. Take this time to be with God and ask him for what you really want, okay? Sound good? All right. The prayers for on the inside back cover of your pumicil are the are the prayers that we sing together. O salutari sostia, que celipan di sostium. Bella premuhun tostilia, taro berfer auxilium, unitrino quid omino, sit sempiterna gloria, qui vitam sine termino, nobis donet in patria. Amen. Jesus, King of the universe, Jesus, Lord of all, I ask that you would send out your Holy Spirit. Jesus, true Son of David, anointed one, pour out your Holy Spirit to each one of us here in the way that we need, in accordance with our desires. Jesus, I ask you to awaken holy desire in each one of us that we would know you and love you and serve you with grateful hearts. Blessed Mother, we give you this time. We ask that you would make it fruitful in our hearts. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and to the hour of our death. Amen.
you at this time. If you'd like to come up closer, you're welcome to do so. If you'd like to be seated, if you'd like to continue kneeling, do whatever you need to do to be able to just be in a quiet, recollected place to offer your hearts peacefully. Look at him and see how humble he is. Not flashy, not with any great fanfare. He chooses to come down from heaven and stay with us. deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, sing what I need you together. St. Faustina is the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Set on the ordinary rosary beads. And it's just asking the Lord for mercy. We do lots of things that aren't good. The world does lots of things that aren't good. But the Lord still loves us and he wants to save us. He doesn't want us to remain in darkness. So we just ask for that mercy. That even though we don't deserve it. Even though we've done horrible things. Or even though we haven't responded in the way that God's asking us to. He's saying, come to me today. I'll take you back. He's so merciful. Look at his cross that he died for sinners. He died for you and he died for me. He remains here. He's not disgusted with you. He's not angry with you. He just wants you back. Or maybe if you've never given yourself to him, he wants you for the first time. Let's just pray together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You expired Jesus, but the source of life gushed forth for souls. And the ocean of mercy was open for us. O oh, fount of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O oh, blood and water which gush forth from the heart of Jesus, as a font of mercy for us, I trust in you. O oh, blood and water which gush forth from the heart of Jesus, as a font of mercy for us, I trust in you. O oh, blood and water which gush forth from the heart of Jesus, as a font of mercy for us, I trust in you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and the blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. In atonement for our sins and those of the whole world as we sing the song that you're
your responses. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, Eternal Father, I offer you the body and the blood soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. We'll do this next one in Spanish. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su dolorosa pasión. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Padre eterno, te ofrezco el cuerpo sangre, alma y divinidad de tu amadísimo Hijo, nuestro Señor, Jesucristo, como propiciación de nuestros pecados. Of 
salvación. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su todo lo pasión. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por su todo lo pasión. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por eso, todo lo sapacio. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por eso, todo lo sapacio. Ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Todo lo sapacio, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por eso, todo lo sapacio, ten misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por eso, todo lo sapacio. Misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por eso, todo lo sapacio. Misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Por eso, todo lo sapacio. Misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and the blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Atonement for our sins and those of the whole world for the sake of His sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of His sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of His sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of His sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of His sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of His sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, for the sake of His sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of His sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of His sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of His sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world, Padre eterno. Te ofrezco el cuerpo y la sangre, alma y divinidad de su amadísimo hijo. Nuestro Señor Jesucristo, como 
propiciación de nuestros pecados y en los del mundo entero por su dolorosa pasión de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero por su dolorosa pasión de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero por su dolorosa pasión de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero por su dolorosa pasión de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero Dolorosa pasión, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero, por su dolorosa pasión, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero, por su dolorosa pasión. Misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero, por su dolorosa pasión, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero, por su dolorosa pasión, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Dolorosa pasión, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Santo Dios, Santo fuerte, Santo inmortal, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Santo Dios, Santo Dios. Santo fuerte, santo en mortal, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Santo Dios, santo fuerte, santo en mortal, de misericordia de nosotros y del mundo entero. Sing Holy God, Holy God. God, in whom mercy is endless, and the treasury of compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us, that in difficult moments we might not despair, but have to submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Amen. St. Faustina, pray for us. St. John Paul II, pray for us. St. Teresa of Calcutta, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. King David, pray for us. St. Alice, pray for us. I invite you, my friends, during this time the Lord was speaking to your heart, or touching your heart, I invite you to just give yourself to him. Jesus, I want your mercy to be the center of my life. Jesus, I don't want to live for myself. Jesus, Send your spirit into my heart. I want to know you and love you and serve you. Father, I ask for a new Pentecost, that as you poured out your grace on the apostles in the upper room, that you would pour out your grace now here in Springfield. As you're pouring out your grace in many places throughout the world where people are hungry for you and in need of you, even when they're not expecting you to come, I ask, Lord, they would surprise us with your grace. Father, 
and the sun who reigns on high with the spirit bless proceeding forth from each eternal be salvation honor blessing might and endless majesty Jesus, Lamb of God, saving love for all, Lord of heaven and earth, Father's love for all, I bow to you. Jesus, Lamb of God, saving love for all, Lord of heaven and earth, Father's love for all, I bow to you. I bow to you, I bow to you. I bow to you, Lord, I need you. Te amo más que a mi vida, te amo más que a mi vida, te amo más que a mi vida, más cántale. Te amo más que a mi vida, te amo más que a mi vida, te amo más que a mi vida más. Me viste a mí cuando nadie me vio, me amaste a mí cuando nadie me amó, me viste a mí. Cuando nadie me vio, me amaste a mí, cuando nadie me amó, y me diste nombre, yo soy tu niña, la niña de tus ojos, porque me amaste a mí, me amaste a mí, me amaste a mí, me amaste a mí. Te amo, te amo, te amo más que a mi vida. Te amo más que a mi vida. Te amo más que a mi vida más. Te amo, te amo más que a mi vida. Te amo más que a mi vida. Te amo más que a mi vida más. Jesus, we love you more than life. Jesus, Jesus, you loved us before we did anything for you. You loved us and you died for us before we did anything for you, Jesus. It's what gives us confidence to run to you. But since you loved us before we did anything for you, your love will be stable for us even now, even in our sin, even in the place where we're ashamed. You're not ashamed of us. Jesus, I ask you to give us courage to run to you. Brothers and sisters, if you wish to come up closer to him, come. Don't worry about what your friends are doing. God will deal with them. <laughs> he wants to love on you. His presence is here and his love is here for you. And if you want him, come up to him. God rewards those who express their desire to him. He can't give us anything if we hold our life firmly clenched in our hands and we won't let him into that place. You have to decide, Jesus, I want you. I don't know what Father's talking about. I don't know. I don't know you, but I want to know you. I want to have joy in my heart. I don't want to be sad all the time. I don't want to be despairing. I don't want to be wasting my life in front of a screen any longer, looking for happiness in places I'll never find it. Jesus, I want to know the purpose of my life. Jesus, I want to know the purpose that you've made me for. Jesus, I need your grace. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Lamb of God, saving love for all, Lord of heaven and earth, Father's love for all, I bow to you, I bow to you, I bow to you.
Friends, the Lord is here all the time, day and night. We don't deserve that. He's so merciful and good. And all he wants is just to see you. That's why he stays in the tabernacle. He wants to see you. He wants you to see him. He's not an invisible God up in the universe somewhere that maybe you'll get to see one day. No, friends, he offers himself to you right now. And he's here with us always. He's not left us alone and he will help you. For those who need to go home, you can do so. For those who'd like to stay, stay as long as you like. If you'd like prayer, you're welcome to stay here. I'm happy to pray with anyone who wants to stay. Um, but also, for Lent, we have several options for prayer. Next week is Ash Wednesday. So friends, let's remain, in, let's remain where we are quietly for a minute. Next week is Ash Wednesday. So let's make a plan for what we're giving up what we're doing extra, and what works of charity we're doing. We have need for help next weekend when the sisters are coming for our confirmation retreat. They're going to be here after the masses for coffee and donuts, and I'd like the youth to volunteer to help serve coffee and donuts after the masses. Would you please consider that and talk to Lupe so we can have enough volunteers to make sure that we have hospitality next Sunday when the sisters are here? Thank you. Um, also, the sisters, when they come, they're going to do a mercy night for us on Saturday night, and sisters are going to play and sing for us. And they're going to share a message of mercy. I hope you all can join us for that after our retreat. It'll be really beautiful. And then we'll be here for a parish mission on Sunday afternoon for the whole family from 2 to 4. So if you don't get to come to the confirmation retreat, you'll at least get to see them there. But I hope all of you will be at the confirmation retreat. I'll be there. It'll be amazing. And parents, I would ask you to pray. You start praying today a novena for your kids. All of us, we pray a novena for this retreat. It'll be nine days leading up to this retreat that the Lord would really have a new Pentecost for us and empower us with the Holy Spirit because we need him. Yes? Good. God bless all of you. The Lord's here. His blessing is continuing to pour out, so stay as long as you wish. Don't think you have to go. You don't have to. You can stay here as long as you wish, but if you need to go home, that's all right. But he's going to stay, and he's going to continue to intercede before the Father for you. Have a good night. Homework next week is Second Samuel. Remember, when we are leaving also, that we genuflect to the Lord because he's truly present here. And we keep it quiet in the church as we can. Thank you, please. <laughs>